history Faithfulness walk beside me The winter storm make way for spring In every season from away Georgetown Christian Fellowship. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and just offer up this time of worship. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of getting together with your body. Lord, it's not a burden, it's a blessing. Lord, I pray for everything that's going to happen in this place today. Lord, for all the worship, we just dedicate this time to you. We take opportunity to sing, lift our hearts up to you, and engage our minds and our voices with you. Thank you so much for worship. Lord, I pray for even the, the teaching and all the fellowship, that it would just be clearly in you, led by you, through you, all about you. Thank you so much, God, for your faithfulness to us. But it's all for you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
get the idea? We're supposed to sing hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> God is worthy of all praise, no matter what's going on in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Give you 
this past summer, uh, we had a uh, church camp. And there is one part of church camp that really stands out to me when I think back about it. And the reason is, is because I felt it really defines like what the body is here for. And it all started when my daughter was standing on the top of um, that platform. And you can't see it, but that's where that, like, um, the blob, is that what it is, just the blob? Okay, where the blob was underneath, okay? So she gets up there, and she's standing on the edge of the platform, and, and the blob is, like, what, 10 feet below her, something like that. So she's standing on the very edge for a while, <laughs> All right. And, you know, she's trying to get up that, that, that you know, um, nerve to make that first step, you know, to just, it just takes one step, right? You know, and it's funny because all day we're walking all over and we never even think about we're taking a step until that step is a big one. Okay. So she's standing up there and, you know, Rachel and I, you know, we're like, come on, you can do it. But what really started to touch me is so many people on the beach that morning kind of stopped what they were doing. And all of a sudden, I heard from different parts all over the beach, come on, Naveen, you can do it. You know, you can do it. We believe in you and all this kind of stuff. And all of this encouragement was going towards her. And, you know, I'm one of those people that I, I truly do believe it takes a village to raise a child. And that's what I felt in that moment, that it's like we were all coming together, realizing that it's like we want her to overcome this like fear of taking that step. And through the encouragement, you know, after about a minute or so, uh, she finally flung herself off the platform onto the blob. But what I really want to focus on this morning is that step, you know, that first step that so many of us at so many different parts of our life need to take. And it all started um, when I was actually reading about Abraham in uh, the book of Genesis. And as I was reading about Abraham, for some reason, um, I read about how he left his home when God called him to go to Canaan. And it's interesting because I'm sure God told him, okay, I want you to go. You're going to head out. And there's a lot of planning and thought and, you know, what he needs to do to make this journey to this new land. But at some point, he needed to take a step. You know, that first step can be difficult. And, and that's why, you know, there's that phrase, you know, every journey begins with a, a single step. Because it's not like the, the hundredth step or the one thousandth step that's difficult. It's the first one. And that's what, you know, as believers, when God calls us to do something like Abraham, what is our response to taking that first step? You know, are we the type where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we may have something on our heart that we know God wants us to do. We may know that God wants us to walk down a certain path. And, and it, it may even be that we're standing here and we hear God speak that he wants something out of our life. How quick are we to take that step to do what he has called us to do? There's a, a story in the book of Matthew that Jesus tells in uh, chapter 21. And starting in 28, it says, What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, Go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did, his fa did what his father wanted? You see, the second son sounded like he had good intentions, right? But he didn't do what his father wanted. Good intentions can be great, but in the end they really don't mean anything, do they? What really matters is if God asks us to do something, do we do it? You know, and I think that there's different levels that we can do this. You know, if he speaks to you and in your heart you feel like the Lord is calling you to do something, are you quick to do it? You're just like, yep, here I go. You know, or some of us are quick to say yes, but like that second son, we never actually follow through. You know, we may be sitting here, maybe some of you this morning, you know, during praise and worship, the Lord put something on your heart. You know, he pressed something into you that you're like, yes, I need to do that. Or maybe something, oh, I, I shouldn't be doing that. And it's like, you know, right now we're like, yes, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do this. 
But yeah, we go home, and it's kind of quickly fleeting from our mind. And we never actually follow through. There's us, and I have no idea why all these are labeled number one. But anyways, <laughs> maybe because they're all important. They're equally important. There we go. Save that one. Phew. All right. Maybe some of us, uh, you know, uh, do you say yes, but then you spend so much time thinking about it that it just passes by. For me, I feel like this might be where more I'm at. I think about things, you know. I think I've mentioned that probably too many times. But anyways, you're like, yes, Lord, I'll do it. All right, let's get a paper and pencil, and then we'll pray about it. And a year later, you're at bullet point, you know, 48, you know, and you never actually follow through with what it is that God called you to do. And then there's some of us, like number one, are you set in your ways and any nudging from the Holy Spirit to take a, uh, for you to take a step is completely ignored by you? And unfortunately, there's some of us he- that are here today that are in that position where in all honesty, you're not even going to hear the nudging. You're not going to hear the voice because you're not even open to it. You know? And that's an area that you need to address. You know, because if you are going through your life and you're like, boy, past year, I've never felt any inkling from the Holy Spirit to do anything, I would start praying. Because I do believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us to do things, to to encourage people. And I'm not talking about like, you know, going on a missionary trip. I'm talking about the simple things. You know, are you willing to simply like pay for the person's groceries in front of you if the Lord speaks it on your heart? You know, are you willing to go up to that person today and, and just because you feel like, I, I want to encourage that person, you know? Um, I, I remember one of some of my daughters, you know, it's like one time in church, she just felt this nudging of the Holy Spirit. Go tell that woman that God loves her. She had no idea why, you know? But it's like, I'm not talking necessarily about these huge things, like go like, you know, change the entire world. What I'm talking about is on our day-to-day basis, in the little things, as you're going through your your walk uh, with the Lord, when he speaks to your heart, which of these describes you the best? Are you quick to do it? You know, does it take you a while? Do you say yes, but then don't do it? Or do you not even hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Throughout the Bible, we read about a lot of men and women you know, um, where God speaks to them, calls them to do something. Some of them are reluctant, you know. We read about all kinds of people in the Bible that are reluctant to do something, you know. One thing that's interesting, everybody in the Bible that we would consider like a hero in the faith, anybody like since Christ died up to this time that we would consider a hero in the faith, at some point was like, all right, I'll do it. They may have felt like, I can't do this. This isn't in my comfort zone. You know, this isn't who I am. This isn't what I should be doing. They may have felt all of those things, you know, but at some point they were like, the Lord's calling me, so I'm going to take a step. And here's what's interesting about this. In my reading of the Bible and just studying different people, God is not all that concerned with our comfort level in following him. You know, how I feel about carrying out that task isn't all that important to him. What he is honestly just looking for is you to say yes and to take that step quick. You know, and the, I would almost argue that the things that, that people have done that have been the greatest things have been things that they were like, oh, I can't do this. And I think that's when God enjoys it the most because then there's no way for you to take credit. There's no way for you to have pride when you're like, I could not have done this on my own, you know, and that's where God wants us to be, where we're at this position of being dependent on him. Um, There's a missionary named Gladys Allward who lived from 1902 to 19, um, somebody knows who she is, uh, to 1970. Incredible woman to study. She's a little lady. And there's a funny story where, well, maybe not funny, but interesting story, where she was in China. God called her to go to China as a missionary. And at one point, there was a prison in China, you know, a terrible prison. A riot uh, broke out in this prison. It was a men's prison. And it was so bad that none of the guards would go into the midst of this riot, okay? And so they call her. How they made that call, I don't know. But they called Gladys, 
and they're like, go into that riot and get everything under control. How would you feel? You know? And then, here, I want to get this right. I hope I wrote that down. Um, because the guard, oh, because she asked, like, well, why me? Why should I go? And he goes, uh, you preach that those who trust in God should have no fear. <laughs> Makes me second guess what I'm saying up here. So what did she do? She went into the riot. She calmed it all down. She got everybody back into their cells where they're supposed to be. Okay? Her story is very interesting. Because when she grew up as a child, nobody thought that would ever be her. Nobody. She grew up incredibly poor. Okay? And she had no means to get from where she was to China as a missionary. She, she felt that stir of God in her heart. You know, she knew that's what God wanted her to do. And so she went to different missionary societies. They said, no. You know, nope, we don't see that in you. Okay? So one day, she's reading the book of Nehemiah. And she reads Nehemiah chapter 1. And she reads, the, and as she's reading it, she reads how Nehemiah's heart broke for, for Jerusalem. And he wanted to go back there and make a difference. And her heart, like, she had compassion for him. Because she felt that same pull. He was working for the king. He couldn't just up and leave. Okay? He, 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 he needed to, like, complete where he was in his place in society at that point. Okay? So she felt that connection to him. And so she, then she moves on to chapter 2. And she's like, he went. And that made a huge difference to her. And this is what's neat. At that moment, as if someone was in the room, a voice said, Gladys, all word, is Nehemiah's God your God? Yes, of course, she replied. Then do what Nehemiah did and go. But I am not Nehemiah. No, but most assuredly, I am his God. That's powerful. She went on to say later on, I wasn't God's first choice for what I've done for China. I don't know who it was. It must have been a man, a well-educated man. I don't know what happened. Perhaps he died. Perhaps he wasn't willing. And God looked down and saw Gladys Allward, and God said, well, she's willing. When God looks down at you, does he say the same thing? That's what I want God to look down and see me as, you know? But there's something about this story that really struck me. And that's that part where it's like, is Nehemiah's God your God? And that really got me thinking. The God who like spoke the universe into existence by a word, let there be light. That voice is the exact same voice that tells you to go encourage that person. You know, it's interesting I, like, wrote this, like, message, like, you know, this part of it at least a while ago. And I'm literally sitting in praise and worship today, you know? And, I, and, I'm, and, and for some reason, the Lord speaks to me. I even stopped, like, like singing because I, I got a little bit choked up. And God, it could, because it was like God spoke to me and said, I gave you this message. Speak it with confidence. And, like, I, I, had, I had wrote this down. And yet, it was at that moment that I really understood, like, the, the deepness of this, this point I'm making, that it's like, when you hear God's voice, that is the same voice that talked to Moses out of a burning bush. That is the same voice that talked to the prophets. That is the same voice that spoke to Jesus when he was baptized and said, that is my son. That same voice is the one you hear. That's powerful. That means something. Because behind that voice is all the power there, that there could possibly be. So when that voice speaks to you, understand the power that is behind that voice. And who you think you are, your own limitations and your own weaknesses, those melt away. Because what is our strength compared to the power of that voice? That's what we need to understand. That's what we need to walk in. To understand, to truly grasp that we are God's instrument. And when he calls us to do something, that we have that power. Not our power, but the power of that voice behind us Amen. to do what he has called us to do. 
Gladys Allward had nothing about her that somebody would have looked at her and said, you're going to accomplish great things in China. But God did. Why? Only because she was willing. And she was willing to take a step when God said, step. Go. Do that. Don't do that. Are we quick to listen? Are we quick to follow that voice? She went on to say, if God has called you to China or any other place, and you are sure in your heart, let nothing deter you. Remember, it is God who has called you, and it is the same as when he called Moses or Samuel. Let me ask a tough question. Do you want to take a step when God calls you? And the, the key thing that I want to stress, stress there is want. Have you ever thought about that? Do you want to follow God's voice? Imagine this for a minute. Imagine God is a conference room, okay? Sorry if I think oddly, but, you know, it is what it is. God is a conference room, and he calls you in for a meeting one day, okay? I have an object lesson. You're going to love this. I went all out. He hands you an envelope. God's plan for your life. He puts it on the table, slides it across the table. It's yours. It's your plan. Or it's the plan God has for you. But he says something interesting. There's a, there's a catch to this. If you open the envelope, you have to do it. What's your first thought right now? Honestly. Are you, are you excited to like rip it open and find out what's God's plan for me? Or do you pause and you think, do I want God's plan for me? You see, imagine Joseph. If he was, went to that conference room, envelope was uh, slid across the table. Joseph, here's the plan for you, I have for you. Joseph opens it up and he's like, um, God, uh, what, what's this about slavery? What, what is this about prison? You know, what about Jonah? He opens up and he's like, a big fish? Why would I be in a big fish? You know, Paul, Paul probably has a book. He's like flipping through like beating, floggings, prison. Like, here's your envelope. Do you want to follow God's plan for your life? I think it's an interesting question, but an honest question that we actually need to address. Because God's plan can be hard. It's difficult. There's no getting around that. You know, we read in the Bible about all these people that, were, that, that took that step, followed God's plan, and we're like, I don't really want that life. That looks really hard. You know, because I, I like to be liked. I don't really want people to hate me. And although it's never happened to me, I don't want somebody to kill me, you know? These things aren't things that we look forward to, you know? But yet God's plan is his plan. You see, the key to the envelope, it's not mine. It's not my plan. And what I think we often do is when we hear God speak to us, we look down that path and we're like, yeah, okay, God, yeah, um, let me, I just want to look down that path that you have for me real quick to make sure it fits my plan. You see, what is our priority? God's plan or our plan? Because most likely, they don't match. Because our plan is generally going to be, honestly, highly selfish. You know, it's going to be the, the easy road the easy route. You know, it's going to be filled with, you know, blessings upon blessings upon blessings. You know? And we never like to think about the fact that God's plan might be really uncomfortable. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may, may be mature and complete not lacking anything. This is God's plan. This is where it gets interesting. Because what is God's plan? Pure joy. You know, James. James was one of the apostles. None of the apostles, or I mean um, leaders of the church, sorry. Um, none of them had it easy. 
you know, they were not popular individuals. They had it difficult, every single one of them, okay? Pretty much all of them were like martyred, okay? But yeah, what does it say? Pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. You see, there's this point about Christianity that we often miss. God's plan will very possibly be difficult, but it's always the best. I read a, um, all right, like I said, I listened to a, um, a biography, Diane Dibler. Anybody have heard of her? I was very surprised I have not heard of her before, like, recently. Because she has an amazing biography called Evidence Not Seen. I, I truly do encourage people to read it. But um, in 1938, um, she arrived in Papua New Guinea with her, her husband. They actually arrived in 1938 on their first anniversary when she was 21 years old. Um, and they had a passion for being missionaries to people that have never been reached before um, in that, in that um, nation. And so right away they go through all kinds of trials and difficulties and things like that. But in 1941, uh, due to World War II, the Japanese eventually took over um, that area. And so what happened is Diane Dibler uh, became a prisoner of war. And unfortunately, her husband actually even died in one of the, the prison camps. And it was terrible conditions. I mean, here's this, like, young lady, had the best intentions, the best motives, you know, desiring to reach the world for Christ, you know, at such a young age. And yet she's met with, like, this truly terrible obstacle. You know, she's, she's suffering, no food, you know, um, diseases and sicknesses and, and people dying around her and all this kind of stuff. And at one point, they take her to this facility because they believe she's a spy. You know, I have no idea how they got that, but unfortunately, they start torturing her. You know, and they do all these, di all kinds of things. And this is what really, I guess, in the whole book touched me the most. And it said, in desperation... This is Darlene speaking. I poured out my heart to the Lord. And this is right after she, she just returned from one of the, her um, torture experiences. Oh, Lord, I just can't go through another one. I can't, Lord. I just can't. Please, no more, Lord. And this is what she felt. He said, when there's no more tears to cry, I would hear him whisper, but my child, my grace is sufficient for thee. Not was, nor shall be, but it is sufficient. That really had an impact on me. Because in the, in, I mean, you know, we talk about difficulties and, and problems that we encounter. And, and, and I know that they're true and they're genuine and all that. But it's like few of us have experienced something to the level that she has. And in her, in her like crying out, in her difficulties, what is the message? My grace is sufficient. Church, that's what we're missing. We, we underestimate the, the, the value, the, the power in God's grace. And we miss the mark. And we think that, that true joy that was spoken of by James, that, that pure joy, somehow comes from our plan. That somehow, if, if my plan can just work, and I can stop having all of these hindrances, and I, can, and I can fix this problem, and I can, you know, stop being around that person, and I can do this, or I can do that. If I can just get my plan to work, then I will have pure joy. You'll never find it. It's just not there. Because what we're searching for, that immense amount of joy, the peace, everything that you're looking for, is found in God's grace. And here's the important message. God's grace, it's sufficient. It's truly all you need. You know, there is nothing else to truly chase after. <clears throat> and the fullness of God's grace is always going to be found in His plan, not in my plan. So are we willing to take that step where we say, you know what, Lord? I don't even want a plan. 
I, I just want to lay it all down. You know, I want to push it to the side. I want to stop thinking about myself. I want to stop thinking about like what I want, what I want to accomplish, what I think is going to bring me joy. I just want to lay it down. And all I truly want to seek is the next time you speak to me, the next voice that I hear. And what if we only had one fear in our whole life? The fear of not being in his will. What if that was the only thing we feared? Not like what people thought, not losing money, not anything. But the only thing that truly scared us was to be outside his will. I think that's when we really start growing. And we really start becoming what he has called us to be. <clears throat> In John 10, 27... It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. It's simple. We are God's. We belong to him. You know, what he is looking for is this, to hear his voice and just start following right away. Just go. Don't think about it. You know, I mean, and I'm not saying like, you know, there's never a point where you don't plan or, you know, if God says, you know, go to China, it doesn't mean tomorrow you book a flight. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we're quick to be like, God, what do you want? That's what I'll do. Like, like Gladys Allward, who is simply willing, not the most qualified, just willing. You know, in my life, <clears throat> as, you, as most of you know, I'm a teacher. You want to know, I had no desire to be a teacher. I remember when I was a teenager. I remember, you know, kneeling in my bed praying. And, you know, because I really wanted to seek after God. There was a point where, you know, I was, you know, trying to figure out, well, what job would, like, pay the most money or, or something like that. Or, you know, but as I grew in the Lord, I, I realized, like, you know what? What I really want is to follow the Lord. So I really started to pray and, and seek after him and find out, like, what is his calling on my life? And I remember when God, you know, said, like, you know, or, or put on my heart to become a teacher, I was like, um, no, you know? <laughs> like, and it wasn't like, you know, I, I wanted to be, like, you know, disobedient. It was that I wasn't, I didn't see myself being good at it at all. I had no skills. Okay, let me give you a quiz. It's just one question. It's not hard. I go up to somebody. I say, I'm a special ed teacher. They say, oh, you must be, what do you think? Oh, somebody had, no, not so nice, but um, patient. I heard somebody say it. That's what almost everybody says. Oh, you must be so patient. You realize, as a teenager, I had no patience. No patience. I was not a patient person, okay? I was honestly, I would say, very different than what you see as me right now, truthfully. But here's what's interesting. God did not start putting these traits and characteristics of a teacher into me until that day when I was like, all right, Lord, I'll just do it. That's when he equipped me. It wasn't before. I think he first wants us to just say yes. To not worry about, is that my personality? Is that what I should do? Is that where I'm gifted in? He just wants you to say yes when he puts something in your heart to do. Would anybody look at this and say that looks beautiful? Probably not. Okay? Um, what's fascinating about this message is I didn't really talk to Rachel too much about it. And yet, this week, what was interesting is God was kind of speaking the same message to her. Isn't that fascinating? So she comes to me one day, and she like, shows me this picture. And what's interesting about this picture, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen it, but it looks like a mess, doesn't it? Okay? When we look at God's plan for our life, in all honesty, this is kind of what it looks like sometimes, doesn't it? We're like, I see no sense in this. You know, I keep listening, I keep following the Lord, but I don't see it making sense. You know, this is the other side. And I think the message from this, and, and kind of as Rachel explained it, is that this is what we see. But someday, if we truly follow God's voice 
and we listen to him, and we trust him, and we walk a walk of faith, I truly believe one day we'll get to heaven and we'll be like, wow, now I get it. You don't have to get it right now. It doesn't need to make sense. I don't even think God really is expecting us to get it because his ways are way above our ways. You know, his understanding is so far beyond our understanding. We wouldn't grasp what he's doing because this beautiful tapestry is literally what he's doing in all of our lives or desires to do it. How he does it with all of us throughout the world even is so far beyond us. But God is weaving. He's weaving away. And he's saying, I need you to go do that. Hey, hey, I got a job for you. I need you to go do that. Are you taking a step? Are you willing to take a step? When God shows you his plans, are you willing to open that envelope and be like, whatever it is, Lord, I don't care. I just want to be willing. In Matthew 4, 18 through 20, it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They're casting a net um, into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. The two words that I want to apply to me is at once. That's how I want God to look at me. Honestly, am I there? Probably not. I, I kind of probably got to stop thinking so much, you know? That's, that's my downfall, I'll be honest. But you know that you have some downfall too, don't you? Something that you need to kind of look at and you realize, I need to change that. I need to work on that. You know? But what I truly believe is that through this week, as you go about your week, if you truly are seeking after God and you're like listening for his voice, desiring to hear his voice, I think he's going to put things on your heart to do. Let's be a church that those two words apply to at once. At once they did it. At once. I know I want that to be me. And I know that, that in your heart, you want that to be you. So as we go forward, God's plan. God's plan, when you start following that, always remember it's sufficient. God's plan will always be sufficient. And that is what we're truly seeking after in our lives, is to live a life for him. Nobody in the Bible, you know, the people I mentioned, Joseph and, and Paul and, and Jonah, I've never read about any individual that regretted a difficult walk. They all, they all rejoiced in it. You know, they were thrilled about the suffering the difficulties, the trials. They rejoiced in it because it brought them closer to God. And that's where we need to understand is that closeness to God is truly what is going to fulfill you when you truly grasp that His grace is literally all you need. And that's always going to be fully found in His plan, not in your plan. So let's go forward and let's be a church, a people that is quickly and obediently ready to take that step when he calls, when he puts something on your heart to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that your voice carries power. And Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I just pray that you would impress upon us the, the desire to listen and to follow you, Lord. Lord, that we would just lay aside our own plans and wants and desires. And Lord, that we would only desire to know you. Lord, that we would just, just cast aside fear and anxiety about uh, things that may be coming up in our lives, Lord. And that our, our complete focus would be on, on seeking after you for what is just the next thing that you want us to do, Lord. And Lord, just help us to be quick to take that step to listen to you, to follow you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just pray that you would bless this church. Lord, bless each person here as they go out this week. And Lord, that we would just have a renewed focus and desire and passion 
for living for you and, and to carry your gospel into this world and to tell people about your amazing grace, Lord. And we just pray this in your name. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capabilities.